Hey, welcome back, Warriors. We've got an exciting episode for you, but what's more is I've got another special guest for you. Today, Owen is going to share his AAA strategy for managing diabetes, how you can apply it to your own life, and we're going to bring in a special secret announcement that Owen and I wanted to share with you guys towards the end of this episode. So let's get to our theme song. I've spent the last 10 years pushing the limits while identifying trends and patterns in my type 1 diabetes management. Follow along as I learn, apply, and share the fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle strategies that I've learned from diabetes experts around the world. The real question is, how can we live fearlessly with diabetes while maintaining stable blood sugars? This podcast is here to give you the answer. My name is Matt Vandevecht, head coach and co-founder of FTF Warrior, and welcome to Part of My Pancreas. Welcome back to the Pardon My Pancreas podcast. Today, I've got a special guest for you guys. He's probably got the best physique in the entire type 1 diabetic community. He's a personal trainer. He's also a coach for type 1 diabetics. I want to bring on Owen. Owen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. <laughs> what yeah, an I, intro. I, I love our conversation. I mean, we've been chatting for like 15 minutes before this even started because mm. you're just such an easy guy to talk to. And it's, uh, it's so fun picking your brain. I mean... You're in Ireland. How is the, the current situation for you right now? It's okay. <laughs> Obviously, it could be better given the, the global circumstances. But we are now in our third lockdown in Ireland. So the first one was the first kind of, oh, what's going on? Nobody knew anything. The second one was people were kind of getting sick of it. Um, but now they got super complacent around Christmas time in Ireland. People were going out more than they should have been doing so the cases have spiked again we're in lockdown so sitting on my laptop training at home having as much fun as i can but it's good it's fine it's okay yeah man i was uh obviously i follow you on instagram i'm a big fan and uh, i saw you make a post uh it's like four or five days ago of you with a barbell over your compost bins and you're doing some <laughs> squats. And I, was, I saw this. I kid you not. I've been looking for exercise equipment for about two months now. I'm like, I should, but maybe not. It's kind of expensive. And I saw you doing that with compost bins, right? And I'm like, <laughs> you don't even need a squat rack. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I was, I suppose, what I was so worried about with the lockdown was the gyms closing. Because yeah. for me, and obviously for you, Matt, the gym and training and working out is such a big part to my day. And I always look forward to it. So when I got the news that the gyms were closing again, I was like, oh, no, what, what am I going to do? So I actually didn't buy any equipment. One of my one of my good friends has kind of like a mini gym. So I stole some of his equipment <laughs> and uh, went out in the cold and got my two wheelie bins and, and set up a makeshift uh, squat rack. So it gets the job done, making the most of what I have for the time being. So what else can you do? <laughs> That's hilarious. I wish I had a friend nearby that had a little mini gym. That's awesome. Yeah, it works out, by the way. I mean, the reason I hadn't gone into like the last two months, I've been searching for gym equipment, right? It's because all of the gym equipment across the board is either sold out or more than doubled in price. So at the beginning of lockdown, you know, a bar might cost 150, maybe 200. Now they're all shooting past 300 for a barbell. I'm like, mm. are you kidding me? Squat racks are like 800 bucks. I'm like, this is ridiculous. But yeah. I saw your post and I was like, I got to just pull the trigger. I got to go for it. <laughs> oh, did you get one? So yesterday I bought a bar. Ah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Unreal. Oh, I'm super what? excited for it, man. Because yeah, the gym's being closed. You know, I'll be real with you. Insulin sensitivity tanked oh. when I stopped going to the gym. I still did home exercises, but uh, for us in California, it's been basically locked down the whole time. Like there's little hmm. snippets of when it kind of reopened, but my gym has been closed the whole time. It's been like 10 months since I've stepped mm. foot into a gym, which is the longest it's been since I was in seventh grade. <laughs> like junior <laughs> high. Yeah, oh, man. So yeah, exercise, super important. But that's what I want to talk to you about today a little bit uh, about, you know, exercise in general. Obviously, you've got a killer physique, like we Thank all you. know, it, right? <laughs> Thanks. Been working on that for a while. But you're also on the other side of the equation, you know, training and diabetes and how that affects us. And you've come up with a system, right? It's a uh, A A no A A A triple A. <laughs> not A A. That's something else. <laughs> yeah, the triple A. So uh, tell me a little bit about that. 
Yeah, so the triple A is, I suppose, a, a simple system or a simplistic way to try and understand and make sense of how you can combat living with type 1 diabetes each day. As we both know, specifically, Matt, and I'm sure as somebody who's listening knows, living with type 1 diabetes is very complicated at times. So the three A's are three words that I had I suppose, put together as three to use as a system to always analyze, be aware of your blood sugars, what you're doing and how to kind of use your knowledge and the data you get from each day and benefit from that. So the three A's are awareness, anticipation and action. So that's four. (laughs) What? What did I say? I said, all right. And then it's, oh yeah, yeah. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) you got the three A's. Uh, And I love how it's kind of, it gives you that 30,000 foot view of the overview of diabetes. And then you dive deeper into each one, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So basically just a brief overview of each one. So awareness is, I always advise people to try and live consciously. So when you live with diabetes, obviously there are so many different factors that influence your blood sugar. There's 42 confirmed factors that influence your blood sugar. Some we can control, some we can't control. So awareness is, I suppose, always being switched on and clued into how these factors can influence your blood sugar. So it basically means to check your blood sugar as much as possible. Understand that your blood sugar at each specific moment in time is as a result of all these different factors. So awareness is understanding, okay, if my blood sugar is 100 right now, what have I done which has led to me getting 100? Have, what was the insulin dose? What was the food I had, the carb count, the protein, the exercise, the sleep, everything that can influence your blood sugar it's, it sounds like a lot to, to even comprehend, comprehend in your head, and it is. But when you live with diabetes, it's something that you almost just do subconsciously in a way. But, True. Yeah. But I suppose by being aware of a prompting word like awareness, it gives you that, that extra shove to be aware of what's going on. Very true. And I love, you know, you mentioned the 42 variables, right? That big sheet that uh, I think it was diatribe put out initially. Mm. I love that you said 42 confirmed variables. (laughs) There are for sure other variables that we're unaware of completely, whether it's because science hasn't discovered it, whether it's because we are just ignorant and didn't think of something. Yeah. 42 confirmed. So that's a lot. And that's still of the confirmed variables. So yeah, excellent distinction there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I feel, look, if you're looking at diabetes from the outside, you will often just have the impression that you carb count or you don't eat sugar or you just take insulin. Of course, there are important parts of it, carb counting and taking insulin and having an exact dose to take. But as we said, 42 confirmed factors. There are so many different variables day to day. So it's important to at least be clued into what they are and the fact that they exist, because when you're aware of them, then it's easier to understand in a way. Oh, hundred percent. I think that being aware of 42 variables can allow you to forgive yourself too, where you see that massive sheet and you're like, oh, okay. It's not as easy as carb count inject and you're done. There's so many things going into this. Maybe I do have a lot to deal with. Maybe I should forgive myself for that 250 blood sugar I saw last night, right? Because there's so many things that I wasn't taught initially, at least for me, when I was first diagnosed, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I was the same. It's, yeah, you, you worded it perfectly there and saying, because there are so many different variables involved, even right now, like I'm speaking to you, but I'm still kind of thinking, where's my blood sugar? Like, is it going (laughs) high or is it going low? So there are so many different things to, to even consider each day. And you're, I, I feel, well, from my experience and from what you have just said, you, you might have been similar. When I was initially diagnosed, of course, my medical team had my best interest at heart. But you're kind of just given like a baseline of information. Mm-hmm. Like 
minimal information to say to say the least um so from there i kind of realized obviously over the years that there are so many different things that influence your blood sugar but in a way we're just a constant science project and i think it was amber from diabetes daily grind that used that and said we're a a walking science project each day because (laughs) Like me and you would pride ourselves in being people who would prioritize our health, would prioritize our diabetes management and would know a lot about it. But even then, there are days when you learn something new here, learn something new there, or you speak to somebody like you and I learn more and you learn more. So when I say awareness, particularly with those three A's, it is just being aware of all these different things. And yeah, you said it right you need to forgive yourself for certain numbers. If you see your blood's high or, or lower than you'd like, it's not because you are a bad diabetic or you don't do work. It's a lot of different things and it happens to everybody. So you need to, you need to go easy on yourself. So true. And I love that walking experiment kind of idea behind it where, yeah, every day it's like, okay, uh, I did this and then that happened. Why? And then kind of trying to work backwards into like, okay, I understand that carbs affect blood sugar. Wait, proteins too? Wait, fats as well, right? And you start learning things along the way. (laughs) It's just full of like these daily hypotheses that we have to kind of figure out on our own. You know, of course we learn from other people, as you mentioned, you know, I also learned from you and we learn from other influencers in the space. And uh, I mean, sometimes I go read like medical journals just because it's fun. And then you learn (laughs) strategies to understand your own body better. I mean, it's almost like, we get to live on a, a new level because we're diabetic, because we get to kind of play with our own bodies or most people don't see those blood sugar responses. They have no idea what goes on behind the scenes, but we, yeah, do. absolutely. And it's so it's kind of cool, right? Yeah. Big time. And I had only briefly spoken about this on, I think on one of the episodes of my podcast recently of that exact thing where it's like, because we are so clued into how our body works and how complex the systems in our body are. We become so much more aware of everything else and we appreciate everything else. When, when you have to take on the role of an organ in your body, you quickly realize how detailed and, and um, intricate your, your body is. So you then appreciate other things and you learn the importance of eating different types of food. You learn the importance of consistent exercise. And since I've been diagnosed anyway, I've definitely gained like a heightened sense of appreciation for my own health because as I was growing up, I was, I was diagnosed at 19. I was always fit. I was always healthy. I was, I was always looking after myself in a way. So the word diabetes was something that I never would have even considered associating associating with myself. But as a result of that and that kind of flick of the switch, you are now diabetic. You kind of quickly realize how fragile your health can be. And because of that, I appreciate what I have more now. And I might not have appreciated it as much if I was never diagnosed. Does that make sense? 1000% yes. Okay. (laughs) So when I was first diagnosed, it was in college. I mean, I was at 19 as well, right? We're like brothers. Uh, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But when I was diagnosed, man, before that period, I would be eating crazy California burritos at 1130 at night, go to bed, wake up, eat Subway sandwiches, like no structure, no routine, no regard for my health, right? Mm. And it was it's this drastic shift where all of a sudden, right. I have to take care of myself. I kept eating burritos at night for a while. I didn't (laughs) health switch, but being aware of like, okay, I have the responsibility of this organ. The crazier part too, is it's not of the entire organ. It's just one of the functions of the pancreas. You know, our pancreas still works kind of, but like for other things in our body. And that's still this much responsibility. Realizing that is like, okay, if one part of one organ requires this much work on my part, imagine what the rest of my body is doing right now, functioning properly. Like what if my <laughs> yeah. entire body shut down? I would not be able to handle that. <laughs> yeah. There's so many different factors and moving wheels. And 
it's honestly incredible. And it's forced me into this new perspective of gratitude where I'm like, wow, my body is incredible. It does all these things every day. My heart beats every day. Mm. And I never stop to consider it. every once. I'm like, wow, thank you, heart. <laughs> for keeping. Me Are you alive. still beating? Are you still? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you're absolutely right. It's incredible. And uh, it also brings in that new awareness of, well, if I eat this, my blood sugars go crazy. So I should probably be at least uh, aware of what I'm putting in my mouth, try to mm. eat healthier, try to take better care of myself, which in turn makes diabetes easier to manage when you're more aware of those things. So that first A, spot on. I love that. Yes. Nailed it. Yeah. Can I ask you, Matt, did, did, okay. you, did you learn that sense of appreciation or was that something that kind of just struck you like your diabetes struck you? Like, did, did you have a time in your life when, I suppose, when you were diagnosed up to now? Was there a time when you really struggled with things? Was there a time where you were in denial in a sense? Or were you just on the ball from, from the start line? Great question. And uh, yeah, I mean, first couple of years, honestly, I rejected diabetes. It was like, I'll take care of it enough to live, but like, this mm. isn't part of me. You know, okay. and I tried to ignore it. I did not tell all my friends about it. I tried to hide it. Uh, I go into the bathroom to take my injections for like when I'm eating at restaurants, you know, I completely mm. ignored the responsibility. Uh, and then probably five, six, seven years in somewhere in there, I learned that appreciation of I'm still alive, but I might not be for much longer if I, if I continue to ignore this thing, you know, and beginning to take on that responsibility seeing how intricate our bodies are. And honestly, the biggest shift of, of that gratitude and realization of what's going on on the inside was when I became a personal trainer and nutritionist and, and learned about how complicated these things are. And, and I was like, okay, I really need to take care of myself or I might not be here much longer, you know? And so shifting from that depression and anger and just denial of diabetes into where I am at now, where it's like, this is incredible that I'm able to be here all the technology that we're wearing now is insane <laughs> mm. with the CGMs and the pumps and all that crazy stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's a choice that we make to be grateful. Of course, I could sit here and say, diabetes sucks and I hate my life and it's going to be the worst. Why can't I live without diabetes? It's not mm. fair. But reality is I can't change it, but I can change the how, way how I react to it and my perspective of it, right? Absolutely. Big time. I love that. And I think even having like having that mindset changes the whole game of diabetes mm -hmm. because my diabetes, your diabetes, it's not going anywhere and it's not going anywhere fast. So we are doing ourselves a disservice if we don't accept it. If we don't realize that, look, it was out of our control. It was, it was just bad luck getting this thing. But because we are living with this for the rest of our lives, because we are living with it 24 hours a day, it's in our best interest to stay positive with it because it's going to be there regardless of us staying positive or negative. So you may as well be positive. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people see me, I'm like, I'm, I'm a happy guy, right? Like I mm. do come off very positive. I'm like, oh, you're just a positive person. No, I'm not. <laughs> right? Like I grew up, I was literally diagnosed with depression. I hated mm. life. I was super, super negative. It's something that we choose to do every day. I think that you're, uh, you're more aware of this as well, where it's like, no, it's a choice to be grateful. It's a choice mm. to be uh, in the moment with their diabetes, not fighting it, but learning and trying to improve upon ourselves. It's not that anyone is a positive person unless they have like a chemical imbalance. That's possible. <laughs> that. that would be a very fortunate <laughs> chemical imbalance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a choice that we make every day to be grateful, to see the positive side of things, to make the best of a bad situation. Yeah, I think, look, exercising your mind and your mental space is just as important as exercising your body. Hmm. So it's very important for me to exercise each day. It's very important for me to eat good food, drink lots of water, sleep because I know that's going to benefit me a lot. But it's also really, really important and probably more important to me to look after my, the space in here and my, my mental strength, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you wake up 
every day of the week and you're like, whoa, I'm really positive. Like you said yourself, you don't, ju- you're not just a positive person. It takes work and it takes, it takes a lot of hard work and consistency to try and remind yourself of that, that look, this is a way of thinking. This is something I have the ability to change. And as I said before, it's kind of like if, if you don't work to have that sense of positivity each day, you're almost doing yourself a disservice. Mm -hmm. And I think gratitude is the big one. Excuse me. And I think something that jumped out at me recently, I'm grateful for the time I've been diagnosed. And you briefly touched on it there with the CGMs and the pumps and the insulin pens and all. We're like half a robot at this stage. (laughs) But um, a couple of weeks ago, I went to my aunties for dinner. And the only person in my family apart from me was my dad's grandmother. So my great grandmother was a type one diabetic. Mm -hmm. And I went to my auntie's house for dinner and she came in with a shoe box. And I was like, why is my auntie giving me a new pair of shoes? But I opened up the shoe box and it was this really rusty old weighing scales. And it was a weighing scales that my great grandmother used to use the carb count and all of, it was like like this rusty old thing and all i had was a two ounce a one ounce and a half ounce weight so she could put her food on one side the weight on the other and potentially carb count <laughs> so i'm massively grateful for the fact that i have been diagnosed at this time because i have a cgm i have insulin pens I have the internet where I can speak to people like you. So that in itself is something you should be grateful for. So it's not all bad. hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, there is something to be said though, about back in the day, less awareness led could potentially lead to less stress where it's like, Hey, you just take one shot a day and that's all you have to worry about. And they're like, cool. So I'm not going to die. And they're like, Hmm. "Uh, yeah, I hope not. (laughs) Right. Of course, we have a lot more certainty behind our health these days. And I would take that as well. Very grateful for it. Um, And I was wondering if you're going to bring up that story because that is super cool. Do you have it with you? I actually do. It's right here. Oh, I would love to see it. it. Oh, my goodness. I was thinking, should I move in the video and get it? But that's it there. That is. Oh, my goodness. That's clean. It's, well, it was cleaned up a bit since I got it, <laughs> but that's what it was. You, you put the weights here and then your food here, say your rice or pasta or whatever, and weigh yeah. it. So compare that to a CGM <laughs> Wow. Or, or, or my fitness pal and your smartphone. There's no comparison. That you know? is incredible. And I know everyone cool, listening right now is super confused. If you're listening and you have no idea what we're looking at, it's a food scale from Owen's great grandmother. Is that right? Great grandmother. Yeah. Super, super cool uh, that she gifted to him. And if you want to see it, you can head over to FTF Warrior on YouTube, get a closer look at it. Uh, but that is just a really cool relic to have. And uh, did she give you any stories behind that? Or is that just like, here, I don't want to be reminded of this anymore? Uh, yeah, get it, get out of my house. <laughs> uh, no, what my auntie and my dad are obviously brother and sister. And all they said was that, they vaguely remember her using it to weigh food. That's about it. Okay. But the only other person apart from me in my family who is diabetic. So pretty cool thing to, to have. Have you tested it? No, not yet. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think it'd be too accurate. Oh, man, I might give it a YouTube go. Adventure of like, Owen tries to carb count with this <laughs> massive machine. <Yeah. laughs> my blood sugars are just 300 for the whole week. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Let's get back on track. So that thing's super cool. You went through awareness. What is that second A within your, your strategy? So awareness and the next one is anticipation. Mm. So I'm big on anticipating your blood sugars and your diabetes management rather than reacting to it. So for me, reacting to something is a response to something that's already happened. So you're almost on the back foot. Whereas when you anticipate something, you can prepare for it in advance, essentially. So how I like to live my life with diabetes and how I 
try to get my clients to live their life with diabetes is to anticipate their, their blood sugars, their activity, their insulin doses, their stress levels even throughout the day. So they can prevent highs or lows before they even occur. So it's like a, a three act structure of the awareness, anticipation, action. So if you want to anticipate things and anticipate your diabetes management, you need to have already been aware for a certain amount of time. So I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody is going out for a 30 minute run. They've gone out for three runs this week. Every single time they've gone for a run, their blood sugar has dropped low 15 minutes in because of my previous experience with running and my awareness around my run, I can now anticipate my blood sugar dropping. So therefore I should probably do something before the run to ensure that I don't drop down low. So that could be eat more carbohydrates, reduce an insulin, whatever you need to do. So again, I'll go back to how I say I want people to live consciously. It's everything you do is an opportunity to learn something more about your body, about your diabetes, about everything really. Yeah. And uh, I was reading through your ebook version of this and you. you mentioned something that was both hilarious, but also true. Sh uh, fool me once. Shame on you, diabetes. Twice, <laughs> shame on me. I was like, yeah, shame on you, diabetes. But then again, <laughs> it happens two, three, four times. That's my fault. Right. And I need to own up to that. Yeah, absolutely. Look, no matter who you are and how you manage your diabetes, you're going to have highs and lows. It's not like me and you never have high blood sugars or never have low blood sugars. Just what? it doesn't happen. It's, <laughs> it's inevitable. But the goal is to reduce the frequency of mm -hmm. how often this happens. So right. that's why anticipating something is so important. So every time you have a high or a low, you can understand or you can look back and understand, hmm, why did I go high there? Did I not take enough insulin? Did I, was I stressed? Did I not sleep that much last night? Whatever it could be, or why did I go low? So there's always something you can learn from your blood sugar. And it's the awareness that's the key to kind of set the whole thing off. And then next is the anticipation. So that's understanding based off your own previous experience what to expect and how to avoid those highs or lows. Yeah. And then of course, you know, get through awareness of understanding what's going on into the anticipation and trying to figure it out before it becomes an issue slash don't let it happen multiple times in a row. But you have the, the action aspect, or I just gave away the third one, but what is the third A? Owen? <laughs> Matt, thank you. <laughs> the third A is action. So awareness, anticipation, action. So, there's no point being aware. There's no point being able to anticipate your blood sugars if you're not going to take action. So the awareness and the ant anticipation is kind of you building up your knowledge around your own diabetes, your own confidence around your diabetes. And then when it comes to taking action, that is you having the confidence based off your own data analysis, let's call it the confidence to take that action, to do what's needed to be done to ensure that your blood sugars are, are kept as steady as possible. And sometimes it can be difficult. When I say action, I don't mean something overly dramatic for people to do or, or massive changes to make. What I mean by action is something as small as giving yourself maybe one unit of insulin for a certain meal because the last three times it's made you go high or cutting back insulin before you go for that run because the last three times you've dropped low. So it's the small daily changes that you can make to benefit your blood sugars each day is what the action is. That's what, that's what action is. Just the small steps you need to take to, to benefit your levels each day as much as possible. Yeah. So within that, of course, you know, be aware, anticipate what's going to happen. And then, like you said, it, that's all useless unless you do something about it. You have to actually implement, take action. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but in the, the journey of that AAA sequence, um, you, know, you mentioned earlier on in the awareness phase, 
the 42 variables that can affect blood sugars. Obviously, we don't have time to go through all 42. <laughs> I mean, you've got a, a section of your podcast where it's just multiple episodes going over those because there, there's so many and it's so in depth and we have to have that understanding of what's going on. Uh, a few of those variables, you know, we've got exercise, alcohol, workouts, all that kind of stuff. What would you say is your favorite variable to go into? What's the most uh, useful for you? Um, definitely exercise. Exercise for me is just an irreplaceable tool to your diabetes management. And I think that's something that everybody needs to do. And exercise doesn't have to be something like going to the gym six days a week. It could just be going for a 15 minute walk or playing tennis, just something you enjoy so you can stay consistent. But I also feel that stress is probably one of the most underestimated factors that can cause people nightmares with their blood sugar. Um, so it's good. It's good for people to, again, be aware of the fact that something like stress can give you, give you a nightmare at times. Oh, yeah. And that's something I've noticed as well. You think back, like, why am I climbing right now? Why are my blood sugars going up and up and up? Oh, I was super stressed out. Right. And it's mm. hours later, it's too late then, but learning from those mistakes for sure. Uh, but within the exercise realm and, you know, that variable specifically, what have you, what have you noticed over the years that has been the most impactful within exercise? Is it consistency? Is it the type of exercise? Is it the blood sugar strategies during exercise? Like, what would you say is like the key that helped you the most? The key that helped me was definitely consistency. Consistency is just what keeps you going. It just keeps that wheel turning. There's no point having your insulin sensitivity increased for two or three days. And then next week you go back to the way things were. So for me, it's been consistency. And I feel that like from my own personal experience, because I, I'm naturally interested in exercise and it's something that I've always really enjoyed doing. That side of it has, has been easy for me. So I've kind of, I almost felt as if I kind of started my diabetic journey with a, with some sort of advantage because I was so into exercise and I often think, and like, I feel that it might be difficult for somebody who's type one diabetic and hates exercise or hates even moving, you know, as I said, exercise doesn't have to be going to the gym. It can just be bringing your dog for a walk, but a lot of people don't enjoy movement as much as me or you would, Matt. So it's more difficult to do that then. But yeah, look, consistency is, is the most important thing. And as we both know, diabetes loves routine. So the, the more consistent you are each day, the more you can learn about your blood sugar and the more, I suppose, the more you can just keep things steady, really. Mm. I think. I love that. Yeah, the consistent insulin sensitivity, huge thing. You don't want to mm. go super insulin sensitive and then super not. Super <laughs> yeah. insulin sensitive. It's a roller coaster. You don't want to deal with that. <laughs> no. But even even over the holidays, the past, oh, yeah, like basically the whole month month of December, gyms were pretty much closed the weather was bad i couldn't get out as much i was drinking more i was eating more it was christmas time i wasn't moving as much as i usually do so that consistency wasn't i suppose i wasn't as consistent as as i normally am and poof, insulin sensitivity just crashes <laughs> and I, my in, insulin requirements are nearly doubling you know, oh, wow. So, well, maybe not double, but like a lot more than yeah. I than I would usually need because I'm so active all the time anyway. Right. I'm on relatively low insulin doses because of how active I stay. So when that kind of shifted over over the Christmas time, it was a big adjustment, and I was definitely definitely increasing the uh, the insulin doses. Oh yeah, I mean at the beginning of the whole lockdown phase <laughs> when I couldn't go to the gym anymore my insulin uh, total daily doses went up by 20% just instantly. And I was like, well, they're okay. It's crazy, <laughs> isn't it? Crazy. And that was with still exercising, like doing push-ups and bodyweight squats at home, but just without the weights. 
mm. up 20 percent of my need it's crazy crazy um when oh, sorry ahead. when you're training I, do you generally do resistance training with weights like what would your number one i suppose number one factor in the realms of exercise be to manage in blood sugar yeah so uh i would probably have to agree with you on consistency being the top it doesn't matter if you're doing body weight exercise at home, calisthenics, or if you're going and powerlifting at the gym, mm. if you keep it consistent, your level of insulin sensitivity is going to stay consistent as well. Cause the muscles get used to whatever you're putting them through, right? If you go lift super heavy one day, and then for the next two weeks, you just go for a jog, that's still consistent, but that type of exercise comes into play as well, right? Mm. Where, you know, weight training is going to give you more insulin sensitivity for longer periods of time but running kind of gives you that daily boost. So it's like you get benefits, but consistency both with time and type are going to be super beneficial. So I love going to the gym. And like I said, this is the first time I've gone this long without going to the gym since like 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> How so does it feel? Weird. But uh, yeah, you got to adapt. And so I was like, okay, I accept it. I'm going to still exercise, but I need more insulin and just kind of get used to that. So it, it happened yeah we make the best of it exactly and look it, it's something that's out of our hands and mm -hmm. you use the perfect word of being able to adapt because yeah our lives are never going to stay consistent our whole lives so having that right. ability to adapt having the ability to understand what sort of shifts you need to make in relation to your diabetes management that's a big one too that's that's massive really because there are going to be times in our life where we're more stressed. There are going to be times when there are lockdowns, we can't go to the gym or we're traveling more or whatever it is. We change job, we change, well, you don't change a relationship, but you <laughs> finish the relationship. Um, and these things might take us out of that routine, take us out of our, our consistency, like take us out of the fact of how consistent we usually are. So it's important to have a good understanding of our own diabetes and how to make those sort of adjustments. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. The power to adapt because you don't feel like you're locked in and stuck, right? A lot of people, they don't like the idea of routine and consistency. So being able to adapt super powerful, but you still have to have that awareness, anticipation, like you have to know what to do in order to adapt. You can't just say, I'm, I'm going to adapt, but I have no idea how, <laughs> but no, that's not going to work. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, you need to have structure, but adapting powerful way, uh, just to live your own life, especially because life does get hectic. Sometimes you can't control that. Yeah. hundred percent. And whoever's listening to this, if they're diabetic and both of us are diabetic, obviously those changes in our life can be a lot more complicated to adjust to. And if we're, if we are more stressed in a given circumstance and, you know, our insulin resistant insulin resistance rises as a result, things can be a lot more difficult to, to keep steady. But as long as you have a solid baseline of information of how to manage your own condition, it's easy enough to make those sort of, those sort of adjustments. And I think I, I had mentioned, mentioned it to you the last time when we were talking, Matt, about the the tree analogy that i use so it's like <laughs> your your diabetes is like a tree trunk yep and your core baseline of information is the trunk and then everything else outside of that are the branches and once you have a solid tree trunk of information your confidence around your own diabetes management you can start branching off onto the branches <laughs> as i say that's travel that's dealing with different routines, new job, more stressful situations, all these kind of things. So it's just about having that solid core understanding of how you manage your own condition. Absolutely. And I don't think you could have come up with a better transition. That was perfect. <laughs> if anybody watching or listening wants to know more about that tree analogy, there, there's a pretty in-depth conversation, pretty amazing conversation that Owen and I had. Owen, we worked on something recently. You want to tell them about it? Yeah. So, well, the conversation that me and Matt had specifically, you definitely want to listen to it. And Matt has been putting in a lot of work on a special project, which I personally am really looking forward to. And I know if you're a diabetic or you have a diabetic in your family or a diabetic friend, you are going to get a lot of unbelievable value from what Matt has planned. So 
I know I'm excited and you should be too. And Matt probably is more excited than anybody, <laughs> but he probably is most excited for a good night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So uh, for everybody who's curious and doesn't quite know what we're talking about, Owen and I were part of this incredible virtual summit that is focused on type one diabetes. Uh, I actually went and interviewed people like Owen and uh, there's 30 plus experts that shared their opinions, their diabetes strategies, and every one of those people is actually living with type 1 diabetes as well, which is a key factor right there because they get it, right? So uh, if you want to get access to those 30 plus interviews with these experts like Owen to figure out what the heck that tree analogy is and how it can apply to your <laughs> own diabetes management and how, how key it is, it's pretty awesome. Uh, you should go to fearlessdiabetic.com. It's a free virtual summit. You go to fearlessdiabetic.com, put your email in, you get access to those interviews and uh, you don't want to miss it because these interviews like Owen right here just gave us, this is, uh, this is the level, this is the caliber <laughs> from every one of those speakers. So be sure to go over, check that out. Uh, and Owen, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for coming on today and having the second conversation. Obviously, the first one was amazing as well, but you continue to show up and deliver amazing value. So thank you for coming in today, sharing your AAA strategy and uh your food scale that was super cool so thank you <laughs> yeah no thank you matt i appreciate it i was delighted to be on and uh, as you say we always have good conversations so i'm looking forward to the summit i know how much work you've put into it and i know anybody listening as i said is going to get a lot of great value from it so i'm also excited to get you on my podcast so a lot more conversations for us to have i'm really looking forward to it absolutely and speaking of your podcast for everybody watching, listening right now, where can they find more of you? Social media channels, anything like that? Yeah, so you can get me on social media at Insulone. It's I-N-S-U-L-E-O-I-N, primarily Instagram. And then my podcast is The Insulone Podcast, Redefining Diabetes. Much like Matt's podcast, you can find it anywhere. And my website is insulone.com. And yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> Love it. Well, again, thank you so much, Owen, for coming on. Everybody go check him out at his socials. And of course, be sure to go find his other interview at fearlessdiabetic.com. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Owen. Have an amazing day, folks, and keep up the fight.